Welcome to another edition of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlis, and I am your host again today. The inspiration for this show um, is really the amazing people uh, that live in Vermont. I hope through this uh, program to interview a lot of people from all walks of life. Behind uh, the show, and the reason why I have posted this now for um, a good six, seven months, is that um, I prefer to have people tell me their story while they're vibrant and alive, rather than reading obituaries of these wonderful people that I wish I had met while they were alive. So um, I, and I believe strongly that everyone has a story. And if you um, would like to be interviewed by me on this show, please write me at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com. And I'd be glad to uh, put you in the queue and get you on the show. Also, if you have a question for our guest, um, please write me and I'll relay that over to our guest and have uh, him or her respond to you and get back to you. Well, today I am very happy and pleased to introduce Wanda Hines. And many of you may know Wanda. She's been a mm -hmm. community activist in this city for decades and has brought much joy to people and joy to people who perhaps haven't had much joy in life. She's really spent her life dedicated to working with those that aren't fortunate enough to, to have some of the things that we take for granted. I'd like to introduce Wanda. Um, and um, Wanda, good to have you on the show. Thank you, Gary. I am so and was so looking forward to it, um, especially in light of COVID and not having a lot of social interaction. And so I'm just happy, happy, happy. So thank you for this opportunity. You're welcome. So Wanda, you are an amazing person from my perspective. And I would uh, was wondering if you would take the audience back in your life, uh, talk about how you've become the woman that you are today. Okay, well, let's start with, um, a lot of people say, um, where am I from? Or some people, well, some people, well, you thought I'd been here forever, but um, actually I moved here when I was five years old from Mississippi and from um, Tiplishville, Mississippi. Um, my background is one uh, grandfather's a sharecropper, another is a preacher, farmer. Uh, we come from out in the country. And um, my father, though, however, was in the service. And um, he was stationed here in 1963. And so that's when my family relocated here. And on his third tour of duty, unfortunately, um, we lost him. And uh, he was killed in war. And it left my mom to raise six kids alone. And so we've been up here ever since um, in Vermont, uh, married, raising families. And, um, and but you, you know what, Gary, it's been a long journey, a long time. I, I want to get back home to Mississippi. I still refer to Mississippi as home. And that's I, home. That's home. Yeah, I just, and I've been in, yeah. It's a, so, yeah. Uh, ask me some more questions. I'll keep me moving along because I'll get. Oh yeah. Started. So uh, yeah, have you been back to Mississippi um, during these years? Oh yes. As a teenager, we vacationed there all the time. My grandfather, of course, would love to see us because we got to, let's say, uh, pick purple whole beans, um, uh, pick cotton, and just whatever he needed us to do on his farm because um, mm -hmm. he was a sharecropper. My mother's father. And so, um, yeah, no, um, those were some of some really joyous times as a child, getting to be around family, cousins, aunts, uncles. Um, it's a different way of life, but yeah. um, innately fitting to me. Um, I remember um, growing up, being there when I was five, I remember going to the segregated school even. Mm. I remember, um, yeah, it, it, you oh. know, then all of a sudden just being snatched up here was yeah. kind of a little disturbing, um, especially with it being in two different worlds. And it wasn't until I was seven or eight years old when I realized it was two different worlds and there was this mm. us and them thing. Mm. I, remember I was at H.O. Wheeler and I fell down and I cut my hand. And, a, and it bled, and my classmate looked at me and said, hey, your blood is red, just like ours. Wow. What, is, what, what do you mean, just like ours, you know? <laughs> and so, um, wow. Yeah, 
about and even though i mean um would so, i want to be any other place to raise my child raise my family it was the 60s it was a difficult time um with uh rights and civil rights and uh, there was a lot going on and so i think that my mother made the best decision that she could um mm. because uh we had come up here she had four kids and we had two more while she was here. My last brother, in fact, was born in November, two months after my father died, three months. And so, wow. again, there were six kids. But, um, no, she raised us up here. And, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, she's, she's my she ever, hero. Did she ever talk about that, uh, how, what life was like up here versus going back to Mississippi? No, she didn't. No, she didn't. Uh, my mother was a very religious person, caring heart full of empathy and caring like myself. <laughs> uh, we we often mm -hmm. refer to people on the blog as Miss Millie's because uh, Miss Millie took care of everybody, fed everybody. If we bought friends over, we would joke about, yeah, my mom is going to change the oil in that coat while you're here because my friends came over and their coats needed cleaning. While they were there, <laughs> she would take their coats and she would clean them. And so even today in my family, I see family, nieces, nephews or Anybody, I say, why don't you come on by and I'll change the oil in that coat? Or if you come by, I'm changing the oil in that coat or, or something. No, my mother was just um, very caring, um, empathetic, uh, very, you know, full of empathy and heart. And I believe, and when she passed about seven years ago, um, I found about a half a dozen Bibles in the house. She had different Bibles, all these Bibles. I always think of people having one or two Bibles, but my mom had all these Bibles. And I remember when we first got here, um, or even before we left as a five-year-old, that's why I remember Mississippi so much, is always going to church, always going mm. to revivals during the week. And uh, this one song, Trying to Get to Heaven for a Due Time, always sticks out to my head. Mm. In my head. And so but I remember my mother did try to take us to church here, the Baptist church, First Baptist Church, but it really didn't work out because... After my father died, my mother, she ended up taking a job working third shift, the night shift at the hospital. She was oh. also a nurse's aide taking care of others, or the nursing homes is what it was. There was a mm -hmm. nursing home, Pearl Street at the time, it's still there, it's got a different name. Yeah, my mom was always just taking care of other people. And she mm -hmm. worked at the Empire Laundromat also for extra money on North Anuski Avenue. Um, even though she had all of us, she was always working. Mm, um, mm, mm. I give it to her. I gotta really give it to her on that one right there. I uh, think that um, maybe working is part of, you know, if you need to be present in your life. I look at that, you know, maybe that translates into that because I know I've worked all my life and right. when I don't work and because of COVID and not being able to talk to people, I say, if I could just be present, you know, if I could just be present in my life and contribute. And finally, as back three weeks ago, because the job I do now, we have 28 supporting faith communities. I get before COVID, I got to go and speak at the different churches. Well, finally, I said, ah. <laughs> in September, well, it, I went out it. to Essex Congregational Church and did, uh, was able to participate in uh, the two morning sermons, uh, services actually, by uh -huh. speaking and sharing. And then uh, two weeks ago at the First Congregational Church, you know, to I was going to say to be present. And I think my mother was that kind of woman. If mm. she could just be present and idle hands were not an option for her, even though she had six kids. And you yeah. certainly have worked very hard throughout the, your life as well. And it's ironic yeah. that you would be going, you're working for Jump. And, yeah. you know, I want you to talk about that in a little bit, but that's all about faith communities. And here, yes, as a young <laughs> child, you grew up in a strong faith community yourself. Yeah, and didn't know it, at, well, didn't realize how entrenched it was. It wasn't until years later when I was director of the Chitlin Emergency Food Shelf, and I was there for 12 years, I, did, I would do public speaking as well, and I would go to churches, but I noticed whenever I would go to the churches, I would get emotional, just, mm. and, and I would end up staying for the whole service. And one church I went to, the uh, Christ Presbyterian church it used to be on Ridgestone campus I started crying I got so emotional I didn't know and I had to stay after and, and talk to the preacher reverend whoever said yeah you need to help me out here something's going on and mm. you know 
I don't know if you have to be totally religious, but some I do believe that we all have a purpose, a calling, something that calls us. You know, I think oftentimes when we have a tragedy in life, I I don't. That's the closest thing I can compare it to. If we have a tragedy in our life. Sometimes we don't think about it. We just respond and we're present. Yeah. You know yep. how yep. that happens. You don't think about it, but you're just present. And right. I, and that's not how I feel whenever I get into the, these churches. Something just and so having 28 churches, which is kind of ironic. I don't belong to any of them because I've never been baptized. And so when people say, "Well, what church do you belong to?" Whenever I go, I go, "I belong to 28. I got 28 churches." You know, and I get to go. <laughs> You know, and it's mm -hmm. I just need to remember to kneel, speak now, go. And I sit through all the sermons and services, and it's most peaceful. People say, but you're working on Sunday. I said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Yeah, it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's coming home a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, and I, and I feel that now. And lately, actually, because of COVID, what I've been doing is I've been live streaming the us. Uh, the Southern Baptist churches in the local community that I grew up in. So I've been tapping in oh. and, and, you know, reconnecting with family. I've kind of really pretty much decided that, I mean, those these last 18 months were difficult emotionally for all of us, I believe. Um, and this time I'm saying, you know what, I'm going to really be a lot, um, I don't know, I'm going to try harder to reach out to family, to reach out and connect and to be present there. And I say that because, I don't know, the COVID really kind of made you kind of think. And Like I said, it was, it was a, sure. it's a silver lining. I hate to say it. It was a yeah. great time of reflection, reevaluation to see where you are. What are your priorities? What is your purpose? How can right. you control? What do you really want to be doing with your life? You know, it's, it's kind of also, um, we see that though in the way that some people just aren't going back to work. You know, they're they're better than exactly. uh, they're, they have a greater value. You know, and and so it's yep. interesting. We're in an interesting time. You know, yes, and we I, are. And I, but it's not the first time we've been in interesting times. <laughs> you know, and so I was talking to my sister the other day. She's down in Mississippi. See, we're trying to start the big re-migration back home to Mississippi. She's down there right now. Uh, and she said, even though it's red, red, red with COVID, it's like, but Wanda, you got to learn how to move through it. We have to move through it anyway. We have to live through it, she says. Have to mm. live with it, live through it. And then I spoke to a, a cousin this Sunday, and I asked her about it right there in Templesville, Ripley, next town over. And, she, and I said, well, have we lost any family, near family? She goes, no, we haven't lost any family. She said, in the bigger cities, maybe a couple, in the, but not out into the country, smaller towns or nothing. No, it's not like it's, yeah. 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 It's, and like I said, it's an interesting time, but we've been here before, All right. whether it's a smaller community and larger community, and we need to just learn how to live through it, move through it. Uh, yeah. Wanda, in your life, you've lived through the civil rights movement, women's yes. movement, Equal yes. rights movement, uh, certainly this pandemic. Mm -hmm. What what has what has that all that meant to you? We've. I, I, what it's all meant to me is I, I wouldn't say meant. It's it is what it is. That's all I can say. Okay. <laughs> I, I okay. Up is life is a series of cycles, and we move through it. And what yeah. I've learned is don't let it exhaust you that you need to self-care. That's what I learned. Okay. Oh, okay. That's yeah. what I learned from the time that I discovered us and them and, you know, are walking in a, yeah. yeah. It, 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 it's about, I learned that there's always going to be something. Yeah. And I think yeah. that what we can do, we can um, control how much of that weight we're going to carry mm. on and, and mm. sometimes to step back. For example, over the last couple of years, especially the last few years, um, I've been asked a lot to come participate in these diversity, equity, inclusion trainings. I just turned down one uh, this week, a uh, couple of weeks ago. That it, you know, And I say, no. Mm -hmm. I, I look at this and I say, there's absolutely nothing that I 
feel that I need that I would want to go there for. And mm -hmm. I've been doing this year yes. after year after year. It's a same, what do they say? Same soup, different pot. That's all it is. <laughs> and, and so oh, I, uh, we've had this conversation. I've had this conversation. And so I think it's for the leadership, the current leadership, the younger leadership. Uh, and I'm not old by saying, but no. I've developed enough sense to come in out of the rain. I've developed enough sense to self-care or know-how or knowledge. And, and I think that there are other things that I need to do. And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't, because it's a cycle. It's going to keep happening. Oh, here comes that right. same soup again. Oh, look at that pot. Different pot. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Not, yes. Because I think that that's everybody's challenge or call. I think that we all should be participating in our lives. It may not look the same. It may not feel the same. But at the same time, I think you need to know when maybe you're not going to have the impact and necessary. Because you got to look at, I think about people of color. You know, we started out with colored. You know, my grandparents yeah. first get colored, yellow. Well, how about colored, Negro, Black, African-American, people of color? And personally, I just found out about BIPOC, that the new terminology over the summer. I was like, what's this BIPOC thing? And I had to look mm -hmm. it up. You know, so you know what that says? I want yeah. the time for you to just go do. Yeah. So I'm going to take my knowledge. And is, if anything, Gary, I do do a lot of one on one private consulting. Mm. Individuals will come to me from the BIPOC community, yeah. um, from the yeah. people of communities. Um, and I will consult with them one-on-one, -on -one, but I say, I won't come speak or be on a panel. Or other yeah. community leaders who are white allies per se will reach out to me and I'm like, no, uh -uh. I'm not gonna be on your panel, no, no. no. Mm -hmm. If anything, the last time I tried to be on one was about three years ago. And I got just so frustrated and mad. I was just so, it just really messed with me. You know, I could yeah. feel the stress. And I said, this isn't healthy for me. This isn't why, why did you get frustrated and mad? What was happening? What was happening was it was the same old conversation. And what in it, 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 the hurt, mm -hmm. and people were sharing their stories in the hurt. And like I said, I have empathy. Mm -hmm. That hurt. And I couldn't just, can you imagine? Just, I've had 30 years of being yeah. just, no. Yeah. Yep. You know, yep. in, uh, yep. it's like fire. You know, after mm -hmm. when the child learns how to put your hand in that fire, to me, it's fire. To me, it's not good for my health. Mm -hmm. So I need to say no, but thank you for the invitation anyway. But I need gotcha. to, it's not healthy gotcha. for me. Yep. And um, that's what I learned. So, but it does, there are other ways that you can help. And I wish there was some of the insight that I'm providing now that I did have while growing up. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm sharing, and I think that as an older African American woman of color, it's my responsibility to share that if somebody asks or needs it. And then you and you're doing that one one on one with people. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And also, you're out there in the community. People see you. They see yes. what you do in your with your life and what you've given to the community every yeah. day. Um, yeah, but, but I want to point out that I Burlington um, has become more diverse, but the thing I love most about my job, it's not about the cultural diversity. It's about now it's a, it's a faith diversity. And there was also actually certain kind of little discomfort, you know, from the whole, uh, you know, faith community thing too, because I got 28 churches. But uh, I like that I don't have to go into a room and talk about race and be the expert and be the you know, I just like the idea that I can be present right. in my terms. Yes, yes. And I love my job, and I feel like I'm right where I'm supposed to be, and I love it. Yeah, oh, that's wonderful. Now, I have a question for you. So mm -hmm. you've talked about self-care and, and taking, on, taking on what you can handle in a given yes. time and situation and being able to say thanks but no thanks or yes, yes let's do it. So mm -hmm. you ran for mayor. And yes. you were willing to take on something quite big at one point. Yes. What was, what was all that all about? I ran for mayor because why not? 
You know? Why not? Why not? <laughs> What's on the other side of this curve? You know, I ran for mayor also. It was a reconfirming moment for me also. You ever go through life and you just think you know everything? Okay, that was me. Okay, that is me. No, you think you got to figure it out. But then again, if you've been around long enough, you do kind of figure it out. You know, mm -hmm. so me running for mayor was about filling that void. There needed to be somebody there to bring that discussion at that time. And so I said, hey, why not? Yeah. And, it, and it was also about professional development for me. Mm. Okay, I thought about it in that way. Mm -hmm. And it was also to reconfirm what was behind the curtain. And it was everything I thought it was. Mm. It was everything I thought it was. And it didn't make me angry, but at least I was better informed how I needed to move forward or those around me that I could share. Okay. And I think that, again, sometimes people take a semester, they'll take a course for the summer. I said, you know what? I'm going to do this. Mm. I this yeah okay. and find out reconfirm and when you what start you looking at politics there's a way of thinking there's a way of responding but it's also it's about alliance it's all about your allies but most importantly it's about the money mm -hmm. and it's about and i remember my first debate sitting on stage at uu uh, uh unitarian universalist church yep and it had started i said I could beat these guys if I had the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, also, though, it's not well, just the money, but also what was most impressive about our mayor, Mario uh, Weinberger, was he had a team of minds, young minds, with technology and messaging that was just so very impactful and impressive, too. And so... Mm -hmm. I didn't have that team, mm -hmm. but um, at, even though I didn't have that team, that didn't bother me, but it was still a learning opportunity to see. Yeah. And at the same time, I didn't need that team to see what was behind the curtain to really kind of understand and inform and to really kind of think about the impact, you know, if mm -hmm. I wanted to carry that. Because people still ask me today, hey, Wanda, when are you going to run for mayor again? I said, well, you know, right now I'm, you know. And my other priorities were family too. But no, it, it I'm looking at it as professional development. I think okay. I look yeah. at caring for my community and being well, present and, you know, maybe just um, vetting, you know, up close vetting of these two individuals. And why not? Why can't mm -hmm. I, write, you know? Yeah. Right. Exactly. What was behind the curtain? What did you, the, what, did, <laughs> the, what? <laughs> what? I was going to ask you, what did you find that was behind the curtain when you were, when, when you were running? Politics. Uh huh. It is about the politics. It's about mm -hmm. what you know, who you know, the money. Um, yeah. It's about also being able to compromise the give and take. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's about having the leverage. Um, but it's also about the team. It's about the team, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think our mayor has had the most forceful, um, skilled, knowledgeable, connected. You know, he's always had that team. Mm -hmm. It's about the team. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, I always like to say, you don't have to be the sharpest tool in the shed to be the mayor, let alone a president. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, it, uh, yeah, it's the team. But I think your team needs to be on message and, and joined in, in, in purpose, too. Uh, that's yeah. the thing I like about the Joint Urban Ministry Project. It was founded by five downtown churches who said, who noticed the uptick of need, they said, you know what, we need to come together, pool our resources so we can better serve economically disadvantaged families. And that's been going on now for 32 years. Now we have 28 churches. Wow. And to me, that's what that is about. I mean, that's I'm not the sharpest tool there. We have uh, volunteers, people who have high degrees, graduates, professors, this, that, that, that. And uh, it's about that team. And so- yeah. When you when I think about purpose and reward and being present, I feel I'm just as present and most impactful as I've ever been right now where I'm at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah it, it's mm -hmm. so. So um, speaking of teams and your own personal team, so to speak, who are yes. some of the people in your life that have influenced you to become who you are today? 
Me, the, the people who have influenced me most have been Gretchen Morris, for example. Uh, Gretchen Morris, who used to be the executive director of United Way for years. Yeah. No, she, well, yeah. wasn't she street first? She, she, was a, she was United Way, you know, she was secretary of human services for a while for the state. Okay, it, well, Gretchen Morris, she was the one that I could sit and have a conversation with one-on-one -on -one about the challenges um, or sometimes I would say something wasn't fair or how could, I don't know, garnish resources. Um, I remember my first year as director of the food shelf, I got um, picked to be on the speaker's bureau, which means to go around Chittenden County and talk about the need. And that first year I got speaker of the year United Way. That was just, ta -da! in other words, some, uh, in Southern expression, I could talk a dirt road down to a path. And I was kind of- <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Anyway, anyway, and so, and I was impactful. And so anytime I would go to speak, she would be present and she would acknowledge that. I think mm -hmm. I spent a lot of my earlier years, and I would say as a woman as well, we don't get the acknowledgement. We could be in a room with a bunch of men, somebody would say something and they just, yeah, and so it was good. She was the first one to really kind of acknowledge mm. me. And before that, actually, don't let me lie, the mother of all mothers for me was Jane Nodell. Mm. In my early, late 20s, uh, because I had an opportunity to serve on the Enterprise Steering Committee. And the Enterprise Steering Committee was um, in 1994, we had that common ground strategy. And um, the city of Burlington was awarded uh, $2.75 million to work over on uh, 70 physical, social, and economic based strategies in the Old North. And I was on the steering committee. And so that was the first time I really kind of began to understand because it was connected and administered through CEDO you know, government structure and how it worked. Yes. The tip, yes. For the beginning <laughs> of revealing back the curtain. <laughs> yes. And, so, and, I, and I learned from her watching that room. And it was also on that committee that started the Opportunities Credit Union. Remember? It, yes, yes. And it also, it uh, solidified the foundation for CCTV. Da -da -da. <laughs> yes. And yes. Um, I think there was a little bit of money in there for one of the early multicultural centers that focused on, back then, African Americans, it would have been called. Right? Yeah. That popular. yeah. And so, um, yeah. And so, um, she was really just as far as teaching me and guiding me about what the process was, Jane Nodell. Mm. And also around that time, or, or even a little bit before, I was privy to, um, to be present, um, the Women's Council. Okay, okay. yep. yep. So I got to go to some of the earlier Women Council meetings, and one of my, uh, I mean, strong mentors is Peggy Lars. Peggy Lars, and I got to watch Peggy Lars and the other women on the council. Just I, I would like to say they would be butt the heads. I, but I would be like, oh, look at those women work out. They're not <laughs> crap not from each other or anybody else. When I would see them outside of, you know, the women's council, and so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say, yeah, definitely mm -hmm. Peggy Lars, Jane Nodell, Gretchen Morris, and and today. Uh, one of my most heartfelt mentors is Lucy Samara. Um, she's with the First Congregational Church, Jump, Joint Urban Ministry Project. She's one of the early founders and organizers of Jump, and she's still there. Mm -hmm. Lucy has been kind of that consult, a uh, voice of reason, I think, on my interfaith path, because I don't belong to any denomination. Yep. And I, she was one of the first people I went to, and I said, Something weird happened. I was up at a church, and because our past crossed before jump, uh, you know, I had um, known she was from a faith community, but our past had crossed on some other kind of community or social event, and so I knew that she was a good listener, Lucy, and I'd been mm. honored. But when that, when I kind of had this emotional overflow uh, at that church, I went and I yeah. spoke to her about it. She goes, "Well, maybe Wanda, there's a different type of." calling and purpose or something i know that and so she helped me sort that out and it's ironic then 15 years later i end up being the director of jump 
the Joint Urban Ministry Project. All and right. I get with her all the time now. So. Yes. And we, we can't forget that your grandfather was a minister. My grandfather was a minister. Yeah, preacher uh, Todd, uh, Todd Hahn. Yes, he was. Yep. So I come from a line of preachers. And um, it would be ironic over the years, I would go home to Mississippi, even as an adult, representing the Hines lineage here. And I go, well, I represented the Hines from Green Mountain State, Vermont, and I would get to speak at the church. Unfortunately, wow. it was when my father's brother started to die, my Uncle John, my Uncle Jesse. And I got to speak at both of the services, but the first time any of them had ever heard me speak in that surrounding, because before I was a teenager, then I come back as an adult in my 30s, they were on the phone all the way from Milwaukee to my mother. <laughs> and go, oh, your daughter was just at the church down in Ball Hill, and she tore it up. And I didn't know. You know, it just, I didn't know. Yeah, mm. there's something about churches. And the last time I was home in Mississippi three years ago, I was at the Tiplersville Ball Hill Church. We got in there, we sat down, and the choir started singing, and I started crying. They didn't even start preaching yet. And I just, right. and I was right. like, oh, I didn't that coming. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, just, <laughs> yeah, there's just something about churches, you know, mm -hmm. which is why I want to, I want to, I got to get back home. I yep. got to get back home. Yep. Heaven for due time. I'm getting there. God dang it. So, Maybe. Wanda, talk. I mean, the fact that your grandfather was a preacher, what was his station in the African American community down there? What is the role of a preacher in in the African American community? You know what? I believe because I didn't grow up in an African American community, I can't answer that. That's the whole problem. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> like stuff is happening with me, I can't explain. But what I can tell you from what I do remember, it is the responsibility of a preacher or any pastor in any community, faith community. I'm going to base it on that. Okay. It's yep. Care yep. of your parish, your parishioners. Yeah. Okay. That I know yep. from my experience of um, going to my different churches here, and it's not any different in the Baptist community. And so, yep. I mean, that's your responsibility. You. Yep. I mean, I mean, you know, I think of Martin Luther King. I think of Jesse Jackson. These are are men that um, their community was much larger than a small faith community, but they had yeah. that presence that that, that, that they cared. Yes. And you think about the African American community. Of, I think about the havens where people would go. You know, to I don't know to pray. I just remember a lot of revivals. I went to a lot of revivals other than, you know, two, at least twice a week, it seemed like. I was always at revivals. Mm -hmm. And it was, revival was just not in one church. It seemed to be travel a lot. I just, yeah. Anyway, let's move on because I'm starting to get emotional about my churches now. Okay, let's talk about okay. something. Let's Let's the, forward. Get me out of here, I, Gary. Get me I out wanna, of here. I want to, I want to talk about, I want you to talk about J.L. who's in the picture behind you. JC. LC. Capital L, capital LC. C. LC. Okay. LC Hines. Tell me about that son of yours. That son of mine, well, let's, I can't talk about my son without talking about my sister, daughter, nieces first. Okay. Go for it. Okay. Um, my sister died of domestic violence in 1991 after five years of domestic abuse and 74 phone calls. He finally beat her to death, her, his, huh. the man he was with. But she had five children when she died, and I adopted the two baby girls because they were also this man's uh, father. They were 18 months and four years old, and I raised them, and I called them. This is when uh, my sister died when she was 31. I adopted them. And, yeah, and so I ended up adopting these two girls. And I would always call them sister, daughter, niece, because they reminded me of my sister when I would look at them. Mm -hmm. Daughter, because I raised them like my daughters, and niece, because they were. Kalima yep. and the Hines, my joy, my joy, my joy. Mm -hmm. Because before that, you ask about life and what I had seen and what I had learned. I had decided I am not bringing any children into this world. Because by then, I had discovered in my late 30s, it's always something and it's painful to certain specific groups of people 
Mm. It's painful because I'm looking at even here, all of the girls, many of the people I went to school with, they're having these babies and they're not even able to take care of them. These, mm -hmm. This heartache, this abuse, this, this, I was not going to bring a child into this chaos if I could not take care of them. Yep. But when Mr. Bentley died, perfect example of we don't question, we're just present. I didn't question, I was just present. That's right. And I raised those girls, my own oh. adopted. But a funny thing happened by the time I was running into 40, I started having something was going on with me again. I don't know what it was. And finally, my 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 doctor said, Wanda, do you do you want to have a child? I'm like, That's, I go, yeah, I want to have a child. <laughs> so I went out with modern technology and I had a son. Mm -hmm. Um and uh he uh it's interesting because his background, he he's um he's Eastern European Jewish, he's Jewish, and I'm me. So he's pretty much biracial, you know, he's he's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um I had my son and the girls, but it was because of the love and the and the time I had with those girls that said, you know, and my other sister who had children who was still alive, she goes, because she always thought I was kind of like cold when it came to children. I was like, I'm not being cold, I'm being guarded. She goes, yeah, just wait till you have children. And I had children and those girls, those young ladies, those sister, daughter, nieces became the joy of my life. And then I had my son and it was probably 95% kicked in, I got it. But when I had my son, everything came clear. Mm. Purpose, meaning, life, I would do anything for my child. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and I did mm -hmm. uh, by that time I was working at the food chef so I had the means I sent them to a private school the Ohavi Sadik preschool yep yep after that I sent them to the schoolhouse uh, which only had four teachers and about let me see 50 students so he could mm -hmm. have that one-on-one -on -one focus Elsie felt uh, very isolated he didn't have a lot of friends he was more content to be on the playground and talk about the gas ring around Saturn. I said, Interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but uh, financially, by the time he was to move to middle school, they didn't have one. Um, he was reintegrated back into public school for his last year of elementary school, which I think was great. Mm -hmm. because he needed to, I wanted him to experience a public school. My son, He's very observant, always has been. And then I remember one day he came home from school and he goes, Mom, I go, yes, son. He goes, I noticed that the students at H.O. Wheeler are not as smart as the kids at the schoolhouse. I go, hmm. yeah, yeah, they don't have access to it. Mm -hmm. And then one day he came home and he goes, Mom, you know what? I noticed the kids, at the, 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 they swear a lot. Yeah, 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 they're kind of background. So in other words, um, he was a good student but I became annoyed because they depended upon him too much for the after school programs to teach the class, the computer class. So mm -hmm. I had to go to the school and say, hey, my son is here for academic opportunities. He's not here to, you know, he was always, I said, but there was one thing though that I didn't want them to teach him, how to write his name because this generation, they don't write cursive anymore. That's right, it's all printing. Yeah, yeah and I said, no. <laughs> Want you to teach him what they write his name. But, <laughs> and then he started volunteering at CCTV, cameraman, doing shows. But then I was working for City Hall. It was ironic. My boss had to cancel his show, the CEDO director. And he comes to me and goes, Wanda, I need to cancel my show. Could you fill in for me today? And I go down there and who's doing producing the show, my son? I was like, wow. Oh, wow. In, middle, in middle school, he's doing this, you know. Wow. But anyhow, Elsie did well. Um, I was pretty much his counselor. I was very guarded with him. I didn't want um, city. I didn't want the Burlington High School counselors or anybody else making decisions for his higher academic opportunity. Mm -hmm. There was an incident that had happened, which kind of always bothered me about the Burlington School District. Let me just share this right quick. <laughs> Not one size fits all. Sure, Amen. we are a refugee settlement community. Or we have students that have uh, don't have the academic skills, but you can't just put them all in the same box. For example, 
I work with my son, fortunately enough, to provide him probably greater opportunities. But it was that time that they had decided that all of the seniors at the high school had to take a college prep class. And it was mandatory. And it bothered me and a lot of parents because number one, my son taught that course when he was in the 10th grade already, mm. you know? And he was way ahead of his curve. And if anything, it slipped out with a counselor. And apparently a lot of the other parents were doing dual enrollment in college. And that was my intent as well. No, my son will be better prepared doing dual enrollment at Champlain College. And, da, da. and so I went and I talked to the principal and he got a waiver. But hmm. I think we can do a better job um, in our school district. Don't put all those children into the same basket and, and think. Right. And it's always just kind of bothered me that students who do achieve are not recognized. My son came home. He was crying one day. He was in middle school. How there was a kid who went to the Burlington Police Department. I mean, we went to the fire department to volunteer for one hour, you know, photo. Yep. And I picked my son up and he was sad. He was crying. I go, what's the matter? He goes, oh, Joey, you know, he went to, over to the police or the fire department and, you know, he got this award for him. He goes, I've been volunteering at the Boys and Girls Club. I've been volunteering now for three years at CCTV and they, and they never acknowledged what and I mm. was like, oh, I was like, oh, oh. Mm. I wrote a letter. Like I said, knowing how the things work, I wrote yep. a letter to the diversity director, CC, <laughs> CC, the, the uh, superintendents, CC, the, the principals, CC, every, and CC, I think Jane Nodell too, that uh, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And they wrote, and then and the and the and the teacher wrote me back. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Hines. Da, 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 da. I said, then I had to say, why is it that kids only get recognized when they do something bad? What about something good? I told you, or I had the conversation with you two years ago. My son had been volunteering at CCTV, and that he'd been producing videos. As a matter of fact, I sent you those videos. Did you look at them? And I gotta admit, he admitted, no, I didn't. I said, mm. Mm. Okay. And so it was kind of after that experience, I really stuck close to LC. You know, some people might say I might have been overly motherly, but um, oh. I wanted the best for him that I could. The girls by that time had been grown and gone, but I knew that as a black male, especially, there would be challenges. And I wanted him to have every advantage or, you know, just knowing he'd have to be better. Right. And, I, yeah. and it's interesting that I spoke to one of my younger brothers and he had said to me, you know, Wanda, I've got two girls and I'm glad he goes, because I wouldn't want to bring a black male into this world. I, want mm. to yeah. I don't know. These are just things that so, you may not have the conversation out loud, but you're aware of them. And there are just yeah. so many things in this world that are not, that are not equitable. You know, at least right. now the school district does have the diversity, equity, inclusion. Yeah. I forget whatever its name is now. Same yeah. suit in a different pot. I'm not sure what kind of pot it's in right now, but I know it's there. Right. And uh, but we can do better. And maybe the school districts are too busy. You know. But anyway, mm -hmm. he went to Rensselaer Polytechnical Institute. Rensselaer yeah. Polytechnical Institute, and he graduated. He just got out of the COVID 2020. He did come home in March, came in quick, boy. He left <laughs> the brand new microwave I got him. I'm never going to forget that. <laughs> He's like, oh, I had to leave quick. You did too. He got <laughs> anyway, he got his degree in communication, media, and design, and he's got a job. He left me in Columbus. And it's interesting. He's the into media, something, whatever you're doing right there, Jordan, for the uh, a mega church. A mega That's church. beautiful. Beautiful. And um, they're looking for a full time engineer. And so, kind of, he's on deck, but it's a mega church. Wow. I looked it up. It's huge. Isn't that ironic, right? Wow. Um, yep. And there you go. It's so, how are the two girls doing? The two girls are both married. Um, sister, daughter, niece, uh, Kalima. 
she married um, a man who relocated here because of Katrina. Hmm. Remember, they sent people all over the country. And right. we had some people here from Katrina. Hmm. And uh, she met a man, they fell in love, and she lives down there, and she's got two beautiful children. Nice. And I am going to go visit last year, but the pandemic happened. Oh, jeez. And then my uh, sister, daughter, niece, uh, Unika, Nika Pudu, she's also married, and she lives down on Shelburne Road. She's got three beautiful children, and her youngest just started elementary school. And mm. uh, no. Nice. He, I don't get to see the girls enough. Um, and, and again, like, I, I, you know, life, when you're raising your kids, you, because there is an age difference, and wherever I'm at, you got to section them off. And so uh, my job is done with LC. I'm kind of like. <laughs> and this COVID really peed me off because I was going to go spend time and see, by default, grandchildren I've never seen. I've never yes. seen children in New Orleans, you know? And so. Uh... And so I'm gonna buck up, and yep. um, whether we have this COVID or not, I'm gonna move through it, and I'm going next summer regardless. If I gotta right. stay in my hotel the whole time, I'm going. Yeah. So right. those girls are just so much joy. They must love you to pieces, Wanda Hines. They do. Let's move along. I'm getting all weepy thinking about it. So <laughs> I don't talk about the kids. Like I said, the son, he's doing well. well. He's a beautiful relationship. Yeah. Uh, with the with the woman he's with, and uh, yeah, she's got a five year intern. She's a graduate of UVM, and so uh, yeah, no, he's good. You know what it is? You want the best for your kids. Hey, my son is doing the develop sound for a, a, a mega no. church. I'm happy. I'm not gonna worry about him. But the girls, I want to see the I want to see the girls. I want to see my sister, daughter, nieces. Yep, yep, absolutely. Now those are the ones I want to see. Now, I, you know, before we run out of time here. There's some things that have happened to you in a good way that I want the audience to know about. You've won some awards, my dear. Yeah, I've won a few awards here. Yep. Yeah, talk, talk, talk about that high school basketball team. Oh, gosh. Don't get me started there, Kevin. Okay, with Conway. Yes. I, I would probably say my most exciting award is in, a, is in a high school. 1975-76, we won the girls basketball championship back to back and there have not been a girls basketball championship at Burlington High School since then. My sister <laughs> Beverly and I played on the team. Wow. Back to back. And uh, that was most amazing. But then I got recruited to go to college actually in Montreal. And I was up there and we have a, I don't, well, actually I got a national title in Canada and I got inducted into the Hall of Fame Canadian basketball. I'm Hi. sorry. Mention that, yeah. My goodness, so, I've got game. I got game. You got but game, you know, all right. Now, unfortunate about it is, my coach years later, when we went up there to get inducted into the Hall of Fame at the Molson Center, talk about kegs. They were like huge, um, and they had paid for everything. He came up to me and he apologized. He goes, "You know what, Wanda? Because I didn't finish college. I only up did, doing two years up there." And he says, Wanda, I owe you an apology because back then you needed to have a tutor. You needed to have the extracurricular help making that transition. Because another thing, Quebec was a, a Canadian, the, like French. French, right. Yeah. And um, going into a different country. And even though I was an honor roll student here, it didn't transfer there. And he goes, I should have gotten you the extra help. That they could, extra help. Instead, I focused on making you a better basketball player. And he did. Mm. I tried for the Olympics and I got cut toward the end. And mm. so, and wow. he apologized for that. He goes, I should have. But you know what? I went back to college um, when I was 50 and I got my degree, Bachelor of Arts in uh, what is, is that? Yeah, yeah. public administration and, and community economic development. Yeah. So I got Ooh. it done. Got, right. I got it done. And I always tell my son as I was as he was growing, I said, don't be like your mom and wait till you're 50. Get it done now. <laughs> and, um, and he did. But I mean, I got it. I got my degree and I'm happy, you know, but um, get it Good. done. I think that knowledge, uh, you know, knowledge, I, I hate when people say sometimes knowledge is power, but it can give you access. And I think it's better to be informed. And it's not about the money. I don't mm -hmm. think life is um 
about the money. I've always said on here, you ask that question, a favorite expression or, or motto of mine. I always say that life is a series of journeys and sometimes we do lose our way. But I think the important thing, thing is that we find our way back, you know, uh, and um, life is like that. It is yeah. just life is a series of journeys. Some of us don't make it back. Sometimes I think of, think of it as a, a gauntlet, you know, yeah. I lost yeah. my sister, you know, and then my brother who has a mental health illness for five years, um, he created that heinous crime at the top of a church street and took a woman's life. And so mental health illness, I mean, life is a series of journeys of gauntlet. Some of us don't make it. Right. And, uh, right. What we can say, I think it's important that we do what we can to help those that are lost find their way back, which is another reason I take exceptional pride in my job. Yes. With the Absolutely. joint urban project, you know? Absolutely. And just, you know, and just if you were the one thing when I was able to speak and I hadn't spoke for a while at the Essex Church, and they gave me the floor and I looked around and I was quiet and then what I said was, if I could just be present, if I could just be present, and I thank them for inviting me there that day so I could be present. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how we need to look at life. Yeah. If I could just be present in my life and just be. And, I'm, and, and as we prepare again to go into this latter part, this next round of you know, lockdown in the winter, right. be present. Yes. Be present somewhere. Do don't. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I I have to say that I'm very present with you right now and very grateful that you're here and part of mm -hmm. this city. Yeah. You're a special person, on the Hines. Gary, I appreciate you. Absolutely. You are too. You are too because yes, you are. I've known you for a while. You're, you're amazing. <laughs> I think that you. Um, doing this celebrate life is 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 a, is great. It's a good idea, well, and especially you. I think it'll serve well, especially as we get ready to go into this next round. Yeah, mm -hmm. be present. Be present. Yep. yep. Anything? Last words you want to share with the the audience? No, it's oh, okay. It's just really nice to be able to talk to somebody, guys. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Be present. Be present. All right. Thank life you, Wanda. Is, Journeys. Do what you can to you see somebody lost, help them find their way back. Okay. That's what That's I want to say. Beautiful. Okay. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.